Welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for uh, gathering once again in this next offering of IU's Ethics, Values and Technology series. Uh, we've been undertaking throughout the course of this academic year, highlighting a wide range of various cybersecurity um, ethics, national security challenges and the convergence of various technical trends um, in these contexts. So today we're very, very fortunate um, to feature a global thought leader in this space, uh, Christopher Painter. Chris Painter, he is an expert in cybersecurity and global policy, cyber diplomacy, and combating cybercrime, um, including as the world's first, I'm sure you hate hearing this, um, cyber diplomat, <laughs> who really a leading force in during the Obama administration, of course, and the international cyber norms efforts um, and since. Uh, Mr. Painter, for example, coordinated not only the US diplomatic efforts um, and has been, up at, including at the pioneering office that he established, the Office of the Coordinator for Cyber Issues at the State Department. I would welcome your thoughts on how that's evolved since, Chris, <laughs> as well as since leaving um, the State Department in a wide range of capacities, including as a commissioner at the Global Commissioner um, uh, uh, for the Stability of Cyberspace, uh, which has been an absolutely fantastic organization to follow. Prior to joining the State Department, um, Chris served in the White House as Senior Director for Cyber Policy and Acting Cyber Coordinator in the National Security Council. He was a senior member of the team that uh, conducted the president's cyberspace policy review um, back in 2009 and has uh, made a wide array of uh, appearances lately and has been the recipient of numerous uh, prestigious awards, including the RSA Award for Excellence in the Field of Public Policy, the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service, the Intelligence Community's Legal Award, and was named the federal uh, to the Federal 100 list among the top honorees there. And as we heard, a graduate of Stanford Law School. Um, so, Chris, we can't thank you enough for taking time out of your very busy schedule um, to talk to us a little bit about your, your thoughts, your perspectives, your experience um, in this space, and look forward to a great discussion from there. So, thank you so much again. Great, and, and really happy to be with you all. And, you know, I'm going to talk about the bad things in cyberspace first, you know, the sad story, and I'm going to talk about some of the things we're trying to do to change that, uh, and, you know, give a little uh, opinion on what's happening in the Biden administration. But also hope that we have lots of time for questions and answers at the end. Uh, first, I, I thought I, I began, you know, as Scott said, I, you know, I have a long um, history doing cyber stuff. I started doing it about 30 years ago, back when no one really cared about it. Um, and um, when there was, there wasn't internet, but there wasn't a World Wide web yet. So uh, when I first started doing this stuff and I was a prosecutor for a long time doing some, you know, the high profile cyber crime cases, Kevin Mitnick is a hacker, the, a lot of the early denial of services they call it, and other kinds of attacks, stock manipulation on the internet, things like that. Uh, and then went on to various other roles in the government. Um, but, you know, one thing, you know, when I got to the State Department and was the, the first cyber diplomat, you know, when you go into a new office, when you go into the State Department, usually, if you ever get a chance to go, most people in their office have had these knickknacks of things around the world they've collected. And we had some of that too, but but I tried to make my office unique. So I had, um, uh, I had movie posters where hackers or computers were the main characters. And this, this one was my favorite. This one, it was a movie from 1970 called Colossus the Forbin Project. I, I recommend you go see it. Um, I saw it in grade school. I sat through it twice, but it tells you something about my character. But it uh, it, it is a, a movie where you can see it's a 1970s movie. Everyone's smoking and stuff, so that's like very 70-ish. Um, so 1970, uh, U.S. builds Colossus to control its nuclear arsenal, take the man out of the middle, uh, have perfect deterrence. Uh, the Soviets steal the information, build their own computer called Guardian in the Urals, and the two computers talk to each other, become self-aware. Uh, and to protect humankind from themselves, take away all civil liberties and take over the world. So the very first movie where um, computers um, took over the world long before uh, movies like uh, War Games or Terminator or all those. But the one common thing I found in all these cyber movies, and I had about 30 of these posters uh, all over my office suite where my team was, uh, and I've identified about 75 of them, um, uh, is they're all pretty dystopian movies. They're all pretty depressing movies. <laughs> There's not a lot of happy cyber movies. There's one or two out there, but not not many. And I think that, and, and so my background behind me, there's a story behind that, which I'll tell you at the end of my talk. So you just have to wait for that, but but it ties into that movie poster. So, you know, um, so the range of threats that we see in cyberspace, so this is the bad news part of the story, is immense. And as we become more uh, dependent on technology as we are for everything, as you guys know, um, 
it just also makes it a very attractive target for those who want to attack those systems, whether they be criminal groups, nation states, or others. And if you think about the range of what we call the term of art in the government was always threat actors, what the threat actors were uh, in cyberspace, there's a range of actors. There's uh, lone gunmen criminal, as I, li I like to call them, you know, the hackers who were just doing it on their own, and they're still out there, certainly. Um, some are doing it just to show they can, many are doing it to make money. Um, transnational organized criminal groups who are doing it to make money mostly, you know, and so there's lots of those and they're like traditional organized criminal groups, but, but very spread out. Um, nation states, uh, and we've seen all kinds of flavors of nation states involved in this. Uh, the director of national intelligence has always said that the four biggest adversarial nation states of the US in terms of capability are China and Russia who are right up there as sort of all spectrum actors as they call them and North Korea and Iran who are getting more sophisticated and catching up fast. And those are big challenges. And we'll talk more about those threat actors and what they've done in a few moments as well. Uh, and then you have, you know, you have the fear of cyber terrorists, but I'll tell you that as much as we've talked about this now for 20 years, we don't really see terrorists attacking computer networks or trying to really cause death and destruction by that. They're using the internet to communicate, to proselytize, to raise money which is really the old wine in new bottles, you know, all the kind of fraud and every other thing you see on the internet, which is just traditional stuff, just using the new technology. So, I'm, you know, that's a different category for me. It's possible in the future we'll see terrorists doing that, but we haven't yet. We have to be ready for that if it happens. And then we have the kind of mixed, you know, proxies where criminal groups are acting as the behests of states, you know, where states either turn a blind eye or are actively involved. And we see that a lot too. There's a very good paper written by Jason Healy uh, at Columbia University, which talks about the different levels of state responsibility. I think he has like eight of them. So he's really segmented this out pretty far. Everything from the state doesn't know what's happening to the state is right there directing it. Um, so you have that too. And that creates a lot of, lot of chaos because of this, this range of, of actors and a range of motivations. You know, as I said, criminal groups are usually um, involved in it for money, whatever the, the activity is where nation states sometimes are involved for money. I'd say North Korea often is trying to make money for the regime through some of their actions, but mostly it is a way to project their state, you know, their state power in some way. It's, it's what we call an asymmetric way to do it because you don't need a lot of resources or capability to build a cyber capability like you would an army or an air force, uh, but you can, you can cause a lot of damage and destruction and, or even just theft of information. And then, then I think it's also important to think about the two, you know, the types of activity. We, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, I hate this when people say so every, everything's a cyber attack. I don't know how Scott feels, but I, I hate, you know, every, everyone, you know, the two things I hate, I, mean, I hate many things, but two things I hate are, well, I'll give you three quick things I hate. I hate when people call everything a cyber attack, like the solar winds uh, incident recently. It's an intrusion. It's a theft of, of the trade secrets and, and government secrets. It's not really an attack. An attack is something where you're actually attacking and taking down networks. An attack is something you want to be seen. You're being disruptive. Intrusion is something you don't want to be seen. You want to take the information. So, so you have that kind of two, those two activities going on. Um, the other, I guess the other phrase I hate is, is when anyone says, cyber war, because we really haven't had a cyber war yet. We've seen cyber used in an actual shooting war, like in Georgia, not the state, the, the country. Uh, who knows about the state in the future, <laughs> the country. Um, we, we've seen that kind of activity. Um, and I think we'll always see cyber as a component of an actual you know, shooting war, but we haven't seen the kind of big cyber conflagration where lots of people are dying and it really is war. Um, uh, so we haven't seen that yet. Doesn't mean we won't, but right now we haven't. And then I hate people saying, um, you know, uh, this is a wake up call. Every single incident you hear about is a wake up call. We've had so many wake up calls in the last 20 years. It's like we're walking in our sleep. We keep going back to sleep again. So, so you know, there's a lot of hype around this, but it doesn't mean it's not a really serious area. Now, you know, if I look at some of the examples of what we've seen and try to talk about those a little bit, um, you know, on the criminal side, I think the thing that's probably biggest right now, well, you know, historically, we've seen what they call carding groups who stole credit card information and put it on marketplaces on the web. Um, that was a big activity at one point. We saw criminal groups doing what they call distributed denial of service attack cases. So this was, you know, you have thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of compromised computers all over the world. 
and you essentially make them like a bot army where you control them and you aim them at another computer to knock that computer offline or to help you do identity theft or some other crime. So, so that, that was a big thing. Criminal and nation state groups do that. But probably the biggest thing we're seeing um, now is, uh, or the most serious thing we're seeing now is ransomware. And yes, there are some states involved in ransomware attacks where you, you, you basically use a vulnerability to get into someone's computer, you lock them out of it, and you either you usually do two things. One, you, you, you hold a ransom. You say, we're gonna give you, we're not gonna let you get into your own computer. And so everything you have is locked. We won't give you the decryption code unless you pay us a certain amount in Bitcoin, um, uh, usually, you know, some cryptocurrency. Um, and most people pay it, frankly, because they're worried about it. And, and this is especially pernicious when you have hospitals as targets, especially during the pandemic. I think that's been a big issue. The other thing is uh, a threat to go ahead and release uh, information. Like we locked your computer, we also stole everything from it, and we're going to make everything you have on your computer public unless you pay up. So it's kind of a dual ransom situation. So we've seen that. And so the criminal groups have been smart, but the nation state groups haven't, you know, are, have been smarter. I think they're still more sophisticated. So you look at some of the big nation state activity over the last few years. I mean, one that everyone kind of knows about, going back to the movie poster analogy, um, was the Sony Pictures attack. Um, uh, and that was an attack. That was actually them both stealing information, so it was an intrusion, but it was also making those computers unusable. Uh, and that was by North Korean actors. This is the first time uh, the president of the United States, then Obama, came out and said, it's North Korea. Usually, we don't have that level of high-level statement about attribution. I'll talk about the attribution issue a little later, but that was pretty significant. Now, the movie itself was terrible, <laughs> we've seen it, but, but it was a pretty big deal because it raised, I think, people's consciousness about this. This is a nation state attacking a company, but, but you know, threatening both physical harm and obviously economic and other harm. Um, we had the, the widespread theft of intellectual property by China, you know, kind of what people described as the wholesale theft of intellectual property. Some people, I think, a little over the top described as the biggest transfer of wealth in human history. Don't know I go, would go that far, but certainly a very serious thing because economically the theft of this information uh, really affected uh, the U.S. And, uh, and other countries. It wasn't just the U.S. who was a target. Their economic future, these companies' economic future, and, and and I'll talk about China and that negotiation a little bit. We had some of the big destructive. Now these are more attacks. Um, computer worms, like what's called the Notpedia worm, which was traced back to Russia, which took down Maersk, the big uh, shipping giant, but also had caused ten you know, millions of dollars of damage around the world. We had the WannaCry worm that came out of North Korea that um, you know, took down um, the national health system in the UK. Um, we, we've had other cyber activity like OPCW, uh, the, the doping agency in The Hague where sort of a Russian Keystone Cop cops group, which is very seem odd for them who'd be more sophisticated to try to break in. Um, and we've had things we hadn't thought about before, frankly, like election interference. Like I will tell you in 2016, when I was in the government and that happened, we weren't ready for that. We were thinking about traditional intrusions, attacks. We weren't thinking about election interference. Um, and then you have sophisticated espionage, like the Solar Winds and Microsoft's Exchange server incidents that happened recently. You know, Solar Winds very serious, but it looks like it was espionage. Uh, the Microsoft Exchange thing, very, very serious. Again, looks like it was espionage one by Russia, one by China. And everyone in the world does espionage and everyone in the world will do espionage till the end of time <laughs> and they have in the beginning of time and they're never agree, they're gonna agree not to. But interestingly, you look at some of these recent cases like the Microsoft Exchange one and that could have been very destructive. That looks like it was reckless in terms of leaving these systems open. So now ransomware and other actors are taking advantage of them. So, you know, a real range of bad activity. Um, and then you have some other issues. You have, you have, you know, every country that can is trying to develop military capabilities in cyberspace. Now, that seems natural because it's a new area and, and you know, this is something you need to, in your toolkit, I suppose. But there's no real doctrine about that or there's just an emerging doctrine in some countries and that creates instability just because of itself. Um, and I mentioned cyber war, but we also have new technologies like, like Internet of Things. Um, the pandemic has been, you know, has showed us how vulnerable we are and how dependent we are on these systems, but also how both criminals and nation states will attack that. 
And then you have something that hasn't happened yet that I really worry about. My uh, friend, the former president of Estonia, um, Thomas Ilvis, used to talk about this saying, look, I worry if someone does a denial of service attack, which is what happened in Estonia in 2007. There was a big Russian-sponsored denial of service attack, and Estonia is a very digital company, the e Estonia, they call themselves. Um, they vote online. They do everything online. And then knocked a lot of them, their, their systems offline for a while, and it was a real nuisance. Well, so that was a big deal, but um, uh, he says it's more serious, though, if someone broke into my hospital, changed my blood type, and I die when I get a transfusion. That's the integrity of information. We haven't seen those attacks yet, ones that try to change the information, like make it so a stock exchange won't sell, et cetera. So you have this huge threat uh, uh, surface, which sounds pretty grim, right? And <laughs> very good. You know, you, Obviously, there's good things in cyberspace. We communicate. We're, we have social growth. We have economic growth. But this sounds pretty bad. It seems like it's getting worse. And indeed, it is getting worse. So, so what do you do about it? Um, now, there's a lot of things in government that we try to do about it. And this is still challenges now in the Biden administration. Things like hardening the targets, making it you know, harder to, to actually get into them. Uh, very tough, um, takes a lot of money, takes a lot of attention and takes a lot of priority. Um, we've talked about you know, technical measures, having computer emergency response teams like talk to each other, that the technical guys have law enforcement coordinate better. Um, and that's had limited success, I'd say, but we we still are a long way. We're so we're we have such great vulnerabilities that we, we still have a real issue. The U, not just the U.S. but the developed world more generally. But then there's this issue of how do you, you know, how do you approach this diplomatically? How can you shape the cyber environment for the future so that you have stability, long-term cyber stability? You know, what does that mean in cyberspace? Uh, how do you how do you achieve that? Um, and if you can, you know, and I think the way different people define it in various ways, um, but essentially the way, you know, this Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace that I've been involved in, which is a multi-stakeholder group that looked at this, uh, basically said it's not an equilibrium, it's not status quo, because we're in a bad place status quo, but it is making, you know, is reaching a state where you have confidence in, uh, in the use of ICTs and change is managed in relative peace but there's also you know, accountability. So, so it's, it's stability is so the bad things, the, the incentives for the bad things are not there and there's an incentive for good things, you know, for actors, state actors, and I'll, I'll focus on state actors. Um, and so that, that's important. And, and you know, different uh, states are defined in different ways, but it's largely around that. So how can you create this? And one way is through diplomacy. And you know, I, as we said, I created the first diplomatic office that was focused on this at a high level in exa almost exactly 10 years ago. We just had our 10th anniversary of my old office um, at the State Department. We were establishing the Secretary's office. That was the first one that not only dealt with cybersecurity, but also dealt with internet freedom issues, internet governance issues, uh, cybercrime issues, trying to pull all those things together because these are not just siloed issues. They're very interdependent. And now there are about 40, over 40 around the world. Um, you know, Australia has a cyber ambassador. The you know the Dutch have a cyber ambassador. The Germans have a cyber ambassador. Um, the uh, you know uh, most of our friends and allies have them. Uh, India has one. Brazil, uh, Russia, and China have high level cyber people. So not just our friends, but our frenemies too. <laughs> so we have a range. You know, it, but it's important because what it does is it takes this this area outside of what's often seen as this very technical area to one which is really a policy area. And I'd say that one of the biggest challenges I found in cybersecurity is that people think it's a technical issue. If you went and saw a cabinet secretary or a, you know, a minister in Europe or a CEO in a company and you started talking to cyber even a few years ago, they would eyes would glaze over, they would say, get out of the room, you guys just deal with that, it's not my thing. But it's a core issue of national security, economic policy, uh, human rights policy, foreign policy, and, and ultimately it needs to be mainstreamed as that issue. We can't treat it as this boutique issue given how dependent we are. And so we need that change and, and making a diplomatic priority, uh, which, which coincided really with the launch of our diplomatic, your know, international strategy in cyberspace. Again, the first in the world that did this back in 2011, um, launched by then the Secretary of State um, uh, Clinton, uh, but also by the Attorney General and others. That, that was pretty important. And, and one of the key things that we did is, you know, there are different diplomatic aspects. One's negotiation, which you expect, you know, that's what diplomats do. And so with this China intrusion, for instance, um, 
you know, for over two years, uh, over a year and a half, we knew there had been these Chinese intrusions that happened for many, many years and nothing happened with them because we didn't treat them as a serious issue. But President Obama, for the first time, said, this is not just a cyber issue. This is a core issue of national security and economic policy because it has big economic dimensions. And we're willing to take friction in the overall US-China relationship because it's so important. And it took a while, it took a year and a half for the Chinese finally when she was coming to the US for a summit to finally say, okay, we'll sit down, we'll admit there's a difference between theft of intellectual property to benefit your commercial sector, industrial espionage, and regular espionage, which everyone does, but we need to figure out. First, they said there's no difference and we don't do either, which was kind of like ridiculous. <laughs> but you know, they finally agreed and, and they sat down at the table and said, yeah, we're not gonna, we agreed this is, should be off limits. They agreed in the G20, all the G20 countries. That was pretty significant. That was an economic norm, essentially, an economic rule of the road that they agreed to. Um, the other thing we did is get coalitions, you know, build coalitions of like-minded countries to go after shared threats. Um, and I'll talk more about that and how we can deter some of these actors by working together. So a big part of what we did is engage with other countries. We also used diplomatic tools to go after some of the threats. There was a big Iranian sponsored, again, what they call denial of service uh, case where they were going after US financial institution websites for you know a year and a half. It was a big deal. It wasn't, they weren't getting the back rooms. They weren't changing information. It wasn't that confidentiality issue that I talked about. It was, you know, but it was a real nuisance for customers trying to reach these banks, et cetera. And the banks were right in saying, well, look, it's a nation state. What can we do? You know, we're, <laughs> we're just companies. Um, so one of the things we did is we used a diplomatic tool. These botnets had concentrations all over the world, including very many in Germany, for instance, and a few other countries. Uh, and we went to those countries and we did what they call diplomatic demarches. Now, a demarche just sounds like a nasty thing, right? Just, it sounds angry. And often it is. A demarche often is where a country sends their diplomat to their other country's uh, government and yells at them and says, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know, uh, but this is a nice demarche. This is help us, you know, work with us. Take care, use whatever tools you have to meet, to moderate or mitigate these, these bots that are compromised computers in your country and we'll reciprocate, we'll help you in the future. So building that, that kind of alliance is really important. But, but I think that the most uh, you know, conceptual thing that has long-term effect that we ended up doing was working on this overall environment, this environment of stability in cyberspace. And, and we did that largely through the UN, but also some, through, through some of the regional organizations through a lot of things, which I won't go into a lot of detail on, but happy to answer questions uh, through things called groups of governmental experts um, and other for, uh, meetings in the UN. A group of governmental experts is not all the countries, it's all the, what they call P5 countries. So, you know, the US, UK, France, Russia, China, Canada, you know, there, there's a small group that's in there and then some other countries. So the first one was 15, the second one was 15 and 25. The first one ended in total failure. They couldn't agree on anything. The Russians wanted a cyber treaty um, to limit our, you know, like an arms control treaty. The US was like having none of that. Um, it didn't get anywhere. The second one though, reached a very important uh, agreement among all those countries. The international law applies in cyberspace. Now, why is that important? Well, a lot of people just thought that cyberspace was this free fire zone. You could do whatever you want. You know, uh, the wild, wild web, do whatever you want. Um, and that's really dangerous. That's really disruptive. That's really unstable. That could cause a huge, that could undermine all the positive things we're trying to do. Some countries said, well, we need a whole different legal set of rules for cyberspace. Well, that itself is destabilizing. You have know, different rules for cyberspace than the physical world. But there was an agreement that existing international law, <clears throat> things like the UN Charter, things like um, the uh, what's called international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, things like proportionality and distinction when you're actually in a war that protects civilian populations. All those things apply in cyberspace. And that's a big deal, you know, uh, to get all these countries to agree. Now, whether they actually act like they agree is a different thing, and we'll get to that, but that was a big deal. So that's one pillar of the stability framework. The international law applies. Now, how it applies, lots of international lawyers are spending all their time arguing about this. There have been volumes written about this. Uh, you know, something called the Talon manuals or two big manuals. Lots of people have other views. This will go on for a long time. Uh, it's still a new area, but it's important to say it does apply. So that's one pillar. The second pillar is, look, you know, international law, that's for these really high things, you know, that happen, you know, when you have acts of war and other things. A lot of things we see every day, you know, that falls below that threshold, like these thefts, like these intrusions, like some of these attacks. 
What do you do about those? And so there was a push to have norms of behavior, norms of state behavior, voluntary norms of state behavior in cyberspace. Now, what is that? It's like rules of the road. You know, it's it's not necessarily binding, but if a state agrees to do it, they're basically saying we're going to live by this. And and I always think there are two kinds of norms. One are norms of restraint. I could do something, but I'm not going to do it because that would be bad. I'm willing to, you know, unilaterally say I won't do it. And I expect every other country to do the same. And norms of cooperation, like we'll work together to some goal. So some of the big ones then agreed to in another one of these GGs, three, you know, a couple of years later in 2015, there were 11 of these norms agreed to. One of them was don't attack the critical infrastructure of another country absent wartime. You know, in wartime, you can bomb a railroad track, for instance, but there are rules, you know, not civilian, you, know, you have to minimize damage to the civilian population, you have to not go after purely civilian targets, they had to be valid military targets. There are a whole bunch of rules that apply. In peacetime, though, you should never go after a civilian infrastructure, you know, there's no reason, there's no point, you shouldn't do it, you should agree not to do it. Uh, and they agreed on it, including Russia, China, the US and others, so that's great. Um, don't go after the, the CERTs, the Computer Emergency Response Teams, or the C-CERTs, the, the Cybersecurity Incident Response Teams. These are like the hospitals or the ambulances on the internet, so don't go after those. Um, and there's a number of others to do with supply chain and other things, and that's great. So those norms, you have international law, you have those norms. Uh, and as I said, they got agreed to. And then, you know, the third leg of this, this stool is uh, confidence building measures. Now, these are practical measures to make sure you would de-escalate conflicts, particularly with cyber being so not understood. No one really understands what the escalation path is for these things. So how do you deal with this? Um, you, need, you need a way to de-escalate. You need a way to talk to other countries. So these are things, you know, they're not rocket science. They're things like hotlines. You know, they're things like points of contact. They're exchanging doctrine with each other. They're holding meetings. There are ways to make sure that things don't escalate and you have communication paths. Um, they endorsed that in this GGE meeting, but it was also taken forward in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in, Euro in Europe, uh, in Vienna, where there are now 16 of these confidence building measures that have been agreed to, again, by lots of European countries and Russia uh, has been part of that. And they've been taken forward in several regional forums. So that's been critically important too. Uh, so all those things were agreed. And then on top of that, I'd say as another foundational pillar, or maybe on the bottom of that, is this idea of capacity building. So the organization that I now am the president of the foundation for is this global forum on cyber expertise, which is um, which is essentially a worldwide capacity building organization that has 60 countries in it, a number of companies, civil society uh, and academia. And the idea behind it is to do more organization of, uh, and, and coordination of worldwide capacity building. We don't have a lot of resources for this, so helping countries get in the game, making sure they have things like national strategies, making sure they have things like these, these certs I talked about, making sure they're cooperating with other countries, they have the ability to negotiate, they have diplomats, et cetera. So that's been a very, uh, I think, strong organization um, started by the Dutch, but now is an independent foundation that's trying to provide that capacity building around the world. And then you had further developments on these issues. There was a big thing called the Open-Ended Working Group in the UN, which is all 193 countries. And remarkably, because I didn't think they would, remarkably, they reached an agreement. Now, it wasn't momentous, but it was an agreement that basically validated those prior conclusions and said, you know, international law applies, these norms apply. Um, and that creates a level of, of responsibility and accountability if every country says that these are what the rules are. So I think that's a, that's a pretty big thing. Um, so you, you've had these, these developments, which I think are really important. Um, and... You know, that's, that's great. Um, and now people are talking about how do you implement these norms? You know, uh, how do you take them forward? Again, capacity building, I think, plays a big role here, uh, which is really important too. But, you know, as important as all those developments are, and I should say that you've also had hiccups along the way. In 2017, one of these groups of government experts got nowhere, couldn't reach, could not reach a consensus. These are consensus-based organizations, couldn't reach a consensus. Um, and there was like a lot of animosity between Russia, China, and the US, which I think uh, caused that. There's another one of these GGs is still going right now. We'll see if it can include with something uh, in the next couple of months. Um, there's clearly a lot of animosity between Russia, China, and the US on, in cyber and across the board. So how these things are gonna play out, you know, is, is not 
has not been figured out yet. And I think that's going to be very tough. Um, and you saw that in these negotiations for this big open-ended working group where things dropped out. You've seen Russia continue to push this idea of a global treaty that is more of an arms control treaty, but they've also pushed for a new cybercrime treaty in the UN and gotten some take up on that. And they're the only cybercrime treaty that exists is from the Council of Europe, which is a really good treaty, but not everyone has signed on to it. Uh, so you know, there's been a big debate as do you need a new treaty, which is going to be probably less less effective, probably watered down, uh, and it would take about ten years to negotiate. So so do you have a lot of these policy battles in cyberspace. You have policy battles around how the internet is governed, where, you know, and all these things merge, as I said before, where Russia and China would like the states to be in control and not the kind of multi-stakeholder system we have now with like the internet wise guys, states, uh, companies, other stakeholders, you know, and ICANN and other places that control how the internet is structured. Um, but that has a human rights dimension and that has a security dimension. So you have a lot of, I think, friction. But you know, one thing that I wanted to focus on just for a couple of minutes before I, I, I wrap up and, and take questions is this issue of, um, well, there's two things actually, but one is, you know, it's great to have all these rules of the road, but if there's no consequences, if there's no accountability, they're just words on paper. And, and in fact, it's even worse than that. You know, if you sign up to these rules of the road and you break them with impunity and there are no consequences for you, that is just emboldens you to do even more. Uh, and if people are on the sidelines saying, hey, let me see what this guy gets away with, and, and then a nation state gets away with a lot, they're going to jump into the fray too and do it. So you, you lead to even more instability by not creating accountability. Now, there's been some efforts to do more accountability through what's called joint attribution. Um, and that's been good. So a number of countries come together and say, hey, it's you. And a lot of people say, well, you know, in the internet, no one knows you're a dog, you know, uh, attribution is impossible. It's not impossible. Uh, it's very possible, especially when it's long-term things. You just don't look at the digital footprints. You look at all the information, the intelligence, the money flows, the boat of everything you have. Um, now, when you accuse someone, they want 100% attribution. They want everything, they want you to show all of your work and, and, and release everything, which never happens in the real world or, any, or anywhere place. But so it becomes, you know, a political issue. And attribution by a nation to it about another nation is always going to be political. But you've had some good things. Uh, a bunch of countries got together and attributed the WannaCry worm, as I said, to North Korea. A bunch of countries got together and did the NotPetya worm on Russia. Um, but you know, you're not going to name and shame Russia or North Korea. They're not going to. You know, they might take it as a, a, a point of pride. Hey, we did this. You know, good for us. Um, so it's, it's a step, but you need to go further. You need to do more than just that, that kind of attribution. Um, and, and you know, you have to look at all the tools we have. So you can use diplomatic tools uh, to get other countries to rally around. That was done with China to some extent. You can use economic tools, sanctions, other economic trade tools. I'd say we've used those, but we haven't used them very effectively or systemically or uh, sustainably or strategically. So we've not done a great job with those. I think we can do more with those. Um, you can use uh, law enforcement tools like indicting people. That's not going to really change a nation state's activity, but it might be able to get you know uh, some more discussion and promotion and help you win allies and friends. Um, you're not going to use kinetic military tools unless it's an actual war. You're not, you know, there was some general that said, you send us a piece of malicious code, we'll send you a missile down your smokestack. No, that's not it's probably a violation, it is a violation of US law, of international law, I think, and we wouldn't do that. But you can use other military tools, like what they call cyber operations. So military cyber tools uh, to do things to the country as an aggressor. And there's some legal issues around that. And there's a lot of discussion around how that's done and how you do that with other countries right now. So you have tools, but we haven't used them in any real strategic way. And that's really made it uh, a problem, I think, for us, because it just emboldens bad actors. We saw you know, we saw this happening again, things are getting worse. There doesn't seem to be any real deterrence working. Now the State Department, my old shop has been doing a deterrence initiative where they try to get lots of countries around the world to join them and work in the flexible coalitions. Um, the EU has recently imposed some, as a whole, imposed uh, some uh, sanctions on Russian, Chinese and other actors. They all had to reach agreement. I didn't think it would ever happen, it happened, so that's good. Um, so there's been some movement, but there needs to be more. Which brings me finally uh, in the last couple of minutes to the Biden administration. And I'd say, you know, that thing I said before about we need to mainstream this is a core issue. 
the Biden administration is, 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 you know, they're talking the talk, so that's good. And they're beginning to walk the walk. And I think it's harder to walk the walk than talk the talk, but it's good they're talking the talk. And they're saying, you know, Biden himself has said from the beginning, look, this is, I'm going to make this a priority at every level of my administration, uh, which is a pretty big thing. Uh, you've heard Ali Mayorkas, the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, who I was a prosecutor with back in the day in LA, uh, talk about the importance of cyber. You've had you know, Tony Blinken, who I work with closely at the State Department, he gets this. Uh, um, Wendy Sherman, who will be the Deputy Secretary of State, gets this, and we worked with her on these issues. Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, worked on these issues. So they're not coming in uninformed, and they're all focusing on this as being a key issue. Um, but they have a lot of challenges. They have these big hacks that happen. They have to respond to them. They have to figure out what the right response is. They have to work with other countries. They have to undo some of the last four years, which was more America first, which turned into sometimes America alone rather than trying to build these coalitions. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges for them ahead. And I do think they're up to it, uh, but it's not going to be easy. Uh, and I think the difference now than before is many, many countries understand the importance of this issue. We still haven't crossed that threshold, so it's mainstream, but hopefully over the next few years, we'll see that. And then I'll finally explain what this background is. So the background um, and how this ties in. So this background is a, a, essentially a room-sized computer. And it, what it is, is I told you about the movie Colossus, very dystopian movie. Um, this is the actual Colossus. So if you, you happen to be in London and you want to go outside of London to Bletchley Park, and Bletchley Park is famous for having broken the... Um, Enigma code. And there's been movies about it, you know, with Benedict Cumberbatch, and it's like, it's a great place. And it's a wonderful place. You can, you can visit the various huts that are there. You go to the big house where the original US-British alliance was set up that turned into the Five Eyes later on. They have a letter there. You can say it's, it's a very cool place. And the, the people who give the tour, some of them, you know, their mothers or fathers had worked there during the war, and it was, it's great. So everyone knows about Enigma. But there was a higher level code called the Lorenz code, which was used by the Nazi high command, by Hitler himself and the Nazi high command. And that was so complex, they had to build the first electronic programmable uh, uh, addressable computer in the world, um, which is this behind me, which is Colossus. Um, and so unlike the movie, which is very dystopian, this Colossus broke the Lorenz code and actually helped save the world. So not everything is dystopian. And, and the, the, bent, the kind of positive messages there is like, look, the threats seem like they're ridiculously high and growing, and that's true. And our vulnerabilities seem to be growing. But if we pay attention to this and really have a concerted action and work with like-minded partners, I think there's a lot we can do. So with that, I will stop uh, and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Chris. That was fantastic. Please join me <laughs> from your homes and offices and thanking uh, Chris for that excellent presentation. Um, so, some of the questions are already starting to trickle yep. in. I'll, I'll give um, folks just a minute uh, to keep uploading their questions. And I'll tee it up just with one to get us going here. And, and you mentioned, you know, for example, some US reticence about uh, new treaties in, yep. in this space historically. And I'm wondering if you would care to reflect just briefly on whether you think this new proposal for a, you know, a new multilateral cybercrime treaty, if that would be, you know, meet kind of the, uh, the Biden administration's um, you know, level, like if, if that, if that could be a gathering, you know, space to, you know, convene some initiative that would get over some of our historic reluctance, you know, to engage in this area. To, well, to well, I think even when the U.S. has been skeptical, they've engaged once, once, you know, the discussions are happening, right? And they will, I think, I, you know, I think they have to make the decision. My guess is they'll engage because better to engage than not engage and have something yep. terrible come out of it. But, but I, I really agree with their reticence on this. Um, and not just because I was in the government all those years. I mean, the, um, you know, what the Russians and Chinese have been the big proponents of that cybercrime treaty and even the treaty in the first committee on, on cybersecurity, what their main worry is and what you see in their documents are things that curtail content, that go after content. So they're not worried, they, they use the term information security and they mean that they're trying to control information uh, they, they're worried about destabilizing information china especially but russia too um they want to have more control over the internet and information more generally and that's when they they list kind of information crimes mm -hmm. under cybercrime. they're not the typical like you know uh hacking crimes and you know child pornography and things there are you know with things we would call first amendment protected speech mm -hmm. um and so that's a real problem. And the US and, and, and Europe and others can't agree to that. So 
you know, in one situation, you could spend years with something that would be so watered down if everyone agreed to it that's kind of ineffectual and you wasted all that time because the bench isn't that deep in this area, right? There's not that many people. Either you get career diplomats talking about it who don't know much about cybercrime or you get cybercrime people who don't have the time to do it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of dangerous in that sense. Uh, or you end up with some countries coming up with a treaty by majority rule that, you know, doesn't take account these freedom of expression and other arguments and is more draconian, and then the U.S. and a bunch of countries dissent. So, you know, it's not a great recipe. Now, does that mean I think we shouldn't engage? No, we should engage. What the U.S. has pushed, and I think this has made sense, is that, look, why are we fighting about a new cybercrime instrument? We have one that even if you don't want to join, you can just model yourself after. And we should be putting all our effort into capacity building, because a lot of countries don't even have cybercrime laws or trained cybercrime officials. So it will be an interesting challenge, how that goes forward and also how these discussions go forward in the UN First Committee around all these issues. They agreed to another one of these open-ended working groups in the next five years, a five-year plan. So who knows what that will bring uh, since they barely will, but they were able to reach consensus, but a lot of the hard issues were left on the cutting room floor. Um, yeah, do you want me to just take some of these questions from the, the Q&A panel? Great. No, thank uh, you, Craig. That was really helpful. Um, yeah, no, there, there's several trickling in there. And, and one is, you know, you spoke about deterrence uh, toward the end of your presentation there, you know, Chris, talking about how d d challenging that can be, right? Whether it's, you know, making it harder for other adversaries to break into our own systems, this kind of so-called deterrence by denial, or this defend forward idea. So maybe taking Yuri's question there, you could kind of uh, talk a little bit about how how challenging this is, right? To, to kind of find this appropriate balance and maybe how the Biden administration can build on some of the progress perhaps during the Trump administration, but also maybe course correct a bit. So, so Yuri, you're, you're probably aware that one of the things, good things I think came out of the Trump administration was a maritime cybersecurity executive order. So that our, our strategy, I guess, is what they ended up. So uh, that's interesting that they focused on that. Um, but let me, but you know, this is a difficult issue. So I said that if you look at all the tools in your toolkit and one of them is, Using cyber operations, you know, where, you know, so military, what the military would call cyber operations, defensive cyber operations, uh, you know. So if you're attacked, you you go after the attacker and you 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 do you cause some pain to them or you disrupt their system. So, you know, what the defend forward um, concept is, we need to be as close to the adversary as possible. We need to be fighting them. They have their infrastructure all over the world. We can't just sit on our haunches and let them do whatever. We have to make sure we're disrupting. And there's a lot of sense to that, right? Uh, and then the persistent engagement one is that we need to, you know, we need to keep persistently engaging with them, and somehow through that we'll generate as understandings and norms. I I reject that last part. I don't think that's how you get to norms. You agree on norms, then you enforce them, in my view. But nevertheless, there is a role for disruption, and that makes sense. You know, they there was leaked articles about going after the internet research agency in, the, in Russia and making their life more difficult by disrupting their activities. Great, that kind of thing, I like it. Now you can risk escalation, but you can control that, I think. You know, you can, you can do that. Um, so I think there's certainly a role as one of our tools. My concern so far is it hasn't been integrated in a strategic way with all the rest of our tools. Everyone's kind of doing their own thing and that doesn't make much sense to me. There's no real oversight of this or metrics for whether we're making things better or worse. We need that too. There's, you know, congressional oversight's not been there because you know a copy of the executive order that Trump signed on. <laughs> so that's that's hard. So you, you need to have more transparency, not transparency about individual operations, but more generally. Mm -hmm. uh, the other concern I have is that look, there's some great things they're doing where they're coming in at the invitation of a country. I think Estonia or some others will say, "Hey, can you help us defend our systems in a joint thing?" Great. But, but there's also part of this that I don't think it's getting a lot of play, which is, look, adversaries have their infrastructure all over the world. And the way DOD thinks about this is there's red space, which is the adversary space, mm -hmm. blue space, which is us, mm -hmm. and gray space. Gray space is everyone else, you know, every other country. <laughs> and they sort of classified as red space if the adversary's infrastructure, say in the Netherlands, that's now red space and they can go after it. Now, if the flaming ball of cyber death is coming toward you, sure. You know, if you have to do that, you do it. But mostly you have some time to react. And I think the better practice, and this is where I, I worry that at least it's not being messaged in the right way, is you want to work with your allies and partners to build that collective ability to go after these bad actors. And if you're doing things unilaterally on the turf of your partners without telling them about it or out getting them to work with you, when that's not necessary. And as I said, there may some be cases where that's necessary. Mm -hmm. 
that's a problem. So we need to we need to figure out how these things all go together. How does that State Department deterrence initiative, which is collective involvement, go with the the Cyber Command defend forward persistent engagement one? Can we we can marry those together? Um, so we'll see. The other thing is, I, I you know, on a conceptual level, uh, the people who and this is not DOD, but the people who came up with this initiative said, well, we're doing this because deterrence is dead. We can't deter actions below the threshold of armed conflict in cyberspace. I, I think that's bullshit because we haven't tried it. We've done a terrible job of doing it. Let's give it a college try. And if we fail, fine. You know, but, um, but I think we still need to both impose those costs for deterrence, but also disrupt. Mm -hmm. And then figure out how this collation works. Okay. So that was one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Chris. That's so helpful. Just really quickly, and we'll turn to Henry's great questions. Are you at all concerned by even some U.S. allies also, you know, using this defend forward mindset? You know, Canada yeah, came I, up pretty publicly. That's the other, yeah, what's good, what's, you know, what's uh, sauce of the goose is sauce of the gander, as they say, you know, so, so if we're trying to promote a norm, it's like, look, we're going to go after the adversary wherever they are, mm -hmm. and, you know, we'd like to work with you, but if we can't, we're going to do it alone. Um, you know, a lot of bad stuff goes through the U.S. We have lots of connectivity here too, yeah. so we may be a little, maybe a little hubris in saying, "Well, no one's going to do this to us because we're the most powerful." But some of the recent events show that we still don't see things. We can be really powerful, and we miss a lot. So, you know, let's. I'm just going to take it. This country. I'm just pulling out of the air. Let's say Germany says, "Well, you know what? We're being hit by some malicious activity that that's based in the U.S. So we're going to take it in our own hands, and we're going to go after." That was that that red space there. We're going to go after that uh, without talking to the U.S. about it. Now, first of all, I don't think the U.S. would be particularly happy. Second, yeah. U.S. companies who were likely with that infrastructure is won't be very happy. So, you, so the question is, how does that all work? Now, I've looked a little bit into. I thought about writing about this. Can you have a legal agreement saying, okay, we can go and do stuff there. You can come in and do stuff there. I don't know. I mean, there might be some Fourth Amendment issues, constitutional issues about whether you can allow another country to take activity in your space that, you know, it, it sort of amounts to a search and seizure, um, even if it's for a positive uh, outcome. So I, that's a hard issue. Um, but I think we have, these are issues we have to talk about. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. No, thank you, Chris. That's, that's excellent. And, and Henry had several great qu uh, questions there in the chat. Um, including, you know, what can we do both, you know, shy of regulation to, to promote good behavior and cyber hygiene, as well as maybe even including regulation. So maybe you could think about that both from the norms perspective, Chris, as well as we haven't mentioned the, you know, Cyberspace Solarium Commission and this idea of layered defense and all the various proposals, some of which were actually codified late last year and some still on the table. Um, maybe there you could turn to a couple of those that might be favorites about ways that we can get our policy better aligned. Look, you know, regulation has been the kind of third rail, the dirty word that no one on either side of the aisle, doesn't matter if it's Republicans or Democrats. I mean, people always think the Republicans are more against regulation, but both sides have been sort of neurotic about it. That said, we have to do more. I mean, the market is not working here. I mean, you know, it's just not. And, and you know, we talked about incentives. We've talked about voluntary frameworks like the NIST framework on the, for critical infrastructure. That's a great thing. I'm a recovering lawyer, so, and we're not shortage of litigious people, but there's no standard of care in this area. So that's why you haven't seen big lawsuits about it. So I think you're going to see a couple of things. I think the voluntary, you know, standards slash best practices will turn into more standards of care over time. So you see more litigation around that. I think some of the regulated industries, you're already seeing this, um, uh, like you know, financial and others, they'll get more regulatory pressure under existing frameworks to do stuff. But I also think there's there's some pressure now that we need to be a little more regulatory, you know. And you have companies saying we want to be regulated. Now I worry about that a little bit too because you know, what does that mean? Um, because you have to do smart regulation. You don't want to, you know, the, this old saw of like, if you regulate, you're going to stop innovation. I don't think that's true. You got to find the, the middle ground to do it right. The other thing is, you know, Europe's already doing it and we're global. Our companies are global. So things like the GDPR, the, the, the uh, general digital privacy protections that, that the EU has adopted apply essentially to American companies because everyone does business there if they want to. Um, Things like the Cybersecurity Act, which sets a voluntary uh, uh, certification scheme are gonna have effects here. So we need to act. We can't just sit on our haunches and say nothing will happen. So, and I think there's a lot of activity in Congress and things short of, of that, like the, you know, all the reports are that the White House is preparing a number of executive orders, including one about software vendors reporting um, 
vulnerabilities if they provide services to the government. So I think there's some things the government could do, but I've been sort of disheartened. I mean, we have we don't even have a, a global or national data breach reporting law. Every state has one. We still don't have it. And it's, we've been talking about it for 10 years. So we got to have, I think, a little more regulation. Now, despite that, there are things we can do. Um, I'm on the board of a, a nonprofit called the Center for Internet Security, which uh, preaches hygiene. I mean, Jane Lute, who's on the board with me, who was the former deputy secretary of DHS, she's all about hygiene. She talks about cyber hygiene constantly. And that, you know, if you did some basic things, you could prevent the vast majority of cyber attacks. Now, the real sophisticated actors will get it anyway, but most of what you see is already existing things. So how can you both incentivize that and get people to do it? Your insurance might help, but I think that's not a mature enough market yet. Um, but, you know, I think it's also raising the bar on why this is important, making people understand this is a key issue. Maybe disclosure requirements the FCC can do, you know, things that people know whether or not you're taking the right precautions, uh, that it might be something that people will select one vendor over another for doing it. But, you know, we're clearly not there yet. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to overregulate, but I'm also not afraid of taking some more, you know, um, uh, bold steps to do this because we're just not succeeding right now. Um, and I think, you know, Henry's other question is, um, yeah, you know, and then the industry pushback is interesting because they said some industries are now welcoming regulation. I mean, I don't know how many times that Facebook ad has been on freaking TV about, oh, they have a regulate. you know, it's because you didn't want regulation. You fought against it. Now you want it. Okay. <laughs> and then the question is, does that, is that hurt smaller companies over larger companies? How do you do that? So you have to do this right. Um, mm -hmm. And there's more other question is about public private partnerships. And we've been talking, I, mean, I, I almost don't like that phrase because it's become a talisman. You know, like you say that and it doesn't really mean anything. So what do we mean by a public private partnership? And I think it's really how you can share information tactically. And I, I think we need to put more around that. So what actually, what information is valuable the government, the private sector can share and vice versa, and then focus on that. We've had lots of legislation you know, so there wasn't any trust problems, there wasn't liability problems, there wasn't trade secret disclosure problems, and still we don't have that sharing. So you get rid of all the bumps, but there's not a reason to do it, so we need to create more of that. So yes, public-private partnership, critically important. We're not even close to there in my view yet. Yeah. Um, and it's tough to do information sharing even internationally these days with all so much data localization and- Well, data localization and even privacy laws, you know? Yeah, and, and um, you know, I think like the, there's a move in, in the EU to kind of clarify mm -hmm. what GDPR means with respect to like what they call who is data and other things. So it doesn't make it harder or that doesn't apply to data you need for network defense, but these are gonna be big issues, I think. Um, and it's, it's hard. Um, Oh, it certainly is. Um, and you, you, and Yuri brought up, you know, NIST there as well. And NIST has been active not only with the cybersecurity framework, but now, you know, the privacy framework. It looks like there's some new workshops on IoT. Um, yeah. that, that's another one of those or kind of go-to organizations. So I'm not sure, Chris, if you'd care to reflect. I know they've been also partnering internationally um, yeah, to try to get the frameworks out there. Yeah, and the, frame, and, the, and the frameworks, I think, are really valuable. I don't want to poo-poo them at all. I think they've been very, very valuable. And NIST has done a lot, and they were built with a lot of the industry components. So it was, you know, it, it, they're informed. They're not ones that are just these, you know, kind of government trying to take its best guess, which I think are really kind of dangerous. So that's great. Um, yeah. And we needed more of that. Uh, and as I said, I think this is not the intention. I think those NIST frameworks will become, you know, more of the accepted standard over time, which I think will be important. And I think, you know, Europe and others do look at that. And so I think that's, that's good. You know, the Internet of Things, I, you know, I mentioned new challenges. These are new challenges. So now everything's going to connect to the internet. You have this, and this is a true story. I was on a panel with Fadi Shahadi when he was then the head of uh, ICANN. We're in, we're in Costa Rica, I think. And um, he talked about this real story about, uh, you know, a bunch of connected refrigerators launching a denial of service attack, uh, attack on um, some banking websites. And I, I said, I was very proud of this. I said, that's a great... Greatest example yet of freezing your assets. <laughs> um, uh, but I think that now I, I, I see Shosh asked about the maritime um, maritime risk. I, you know, I don't have a lot of detail on that. I, as I said, this was a focus point at the end of the uh, Trump administration. So I, I um, suggest you take a look at that. Uh, mm -hmm. It is one of the critical industries. So and, and I, I'll say that we certainly saw with the not Petty uh, Maersk situation 
-hmm. where you know global shipping can be taken you know to a standstill because of that now that happened in the suez canal and that wasn't cyber but it can happen for cyber means too so we have to pay attention to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're approaching the end of our time. So we'll try to do a bit of a lightning round here. There, there was a question about kind of new technologies, uh, 5G, 6G, quantum, blockchain, AI. My gosh, Chris, um, are, are any of these, maybe you could reflect briefly on, on game changers. We love that phrase, right? Uh, um, how is this going to incentivize them? I mean, they raise new issues, right? So 5G and 6G and 7G raise the issue of supply chain vulnerabilities. We should never have been in the situation where you had to choose between China. Uh, you know, Chinese producers, we weren't... Uh, uh, confident in and like a European producer that we, we should have more choices. Um, we don't like in the US think something called industrial policy, but we got to like step up and actually start helping develop competitors, both in the US, but also with our allies and partners. And we got to invest in that. And so we don't have that choice again. So supply chain will always be an issue, uh, certainly as we go forward. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned some of the things in the Solarium Commission, and one of them was also to reinstate my old office, which I think will happen at some point at the State Department. I think that'll be elevated. I think it's being studied now. But, but it's also to get ahead of some of these, these issues and, and, and think about them before we have to deal with them you know, <laughs> uh, at, the, at the time, because once you're there, you've already lost. And that's, that's been the Huawei issue. I mean, I'd say Australia was well ahead of us on Huawei. They were a year before we even started raising the alarm bells. And I think it's appropriate for has, uh, us to have those conversations and focus on, on those issues. And mm -hmm. if we don't look at that, again, we're going to be caught in the same situation again. So, so we are, I think, focusing on, are we investing in doing the things we need to? Eh, I don't know. Uh, it's good that the White House has a part of the National Security Council, a directorate there that's called, uh, is dealing with emerging technologies. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're at least focusing on it, but we need to take action too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maintain free trade. I mean, you want you know you want a global trade system. You know, we have been advocating for that, and we need to continue to do that. We have to also deal with situations where, you know, the vulnerabilities are there. It's an untrusted system. How do we deal with untrusted systems going forward? Yeah. How do we build that resiliency? Not e no easy answers to that. No, there certainly isn't. <laughs> it's always a challenge when you do a, like a, a cyber talk like this, right? We can tee up lots of issues, but we have to leave people hanging. But it's a great chance because, as you said, there's a lot of people that can, can contribute at a lot of levels because we're still dealing with and figuring out a lot of this as we go. Yeah, and um, I, I say one thing to the, to the students who are on the call. I mean, one, yeah, you know, this is a really interesting area. It's an evolving area. You know, I used to say to, to diplomats who were training around the world that, look, unlike a lot of traditional areas where everything's already been decided and you don't really get much input and you're just delivering the news, this is an area we can actually help shape policy. So it's really exciting. So if you're interested in this area, I certainly encourage you to get involved. Could not agree more. And that might honestly be a good point to end on since we're out of time. So apologies um, for anybody um, who, including Saharash, we didn't quite get to uh, your question, but please join me once again in thanking Chris for the, the really, really excellent presentation. Thank you, thank you. Great discussion, great questions, everybody. Um, and, uh, and Chris, thanks for all the great work you're doing around the world to build capacity and make this a more manageable problem. Well, very happy <laughs> to be with you all and good luck. Uh, and I'm sure we'll chat again in the future. I know we'll chat again in the future, but absolutely. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. Thank you everybody for joining. All right. Bye-bye.